It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about. Want to start out with some of my favorite, my favorite, my favorite people in government right now. And look, I've had a bunch of people saying, you know, why you support Joe Biden? And my response is always the same. Uh, Jennifer Bruzio, um, general counsel at the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, Lena Khan over at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, Julie Sue, secretary of labor. Uh, Catherine Tai, the trade representative. Uh, all those folks. Because I think the way I see it and what I see them doing uh, moving in the right direction, uh, fighting for working people. Uh, as I've said a million times, my true north is who's who's making things better for, for work, working people like us. And understand, <laughs> you can easily take uh, the, the Jennifer Abruzzio, the general counsel of the NLRB, compare it to the Trump person and, and simple, uh, Abruzzio. A labor person fighting for labor rights, uh, fighting for working people to you know, organize the mission of the the NLRA, uh, you know, encourage collective bargaining. Uh, whereas the Trump guy, uh, Peter Robb, not so much. Uh, you could go uh, look at Julie Sue, the, the Secretary of Labor, um, labor person, cares about working people. Uh, you could look at the Trump person, mm, Eugene Scalia, not so much. Uh, corporate lawyer, union buster, um, you know, it's simple, and you go. But Rick, you know, um, it, it, you know, they're they're just two old guys fighting it out. Yeah, uh, two old guys are fighting it out, and I agree. Uh, but who do they put in the positions that matter? Who do they put into the positions that are going to help either make conditions worse or make conditions better? Uh, I argue that Trump, as we talked about, with schedule his idea of schedule F, making patronage great again, going to go after those, you know. Those non-loyalists, and and put people into positions like the NLR, uh, be like the Department of Labor, like uh, all of those things that that are supposed to help working people get that step forward. Uh, well, their job would be to not so much. Uh, and I I gotta tell you, I loved the the comment by Jennifer Bruzio uh, at the Roosevelt Institute's panel uh, here recently. Uh, talking about uh, SpaceX, Trader Joe's, and Amazon. You know, we talked about this the other day, that they are filing a, a lawsuit to make the NLRA or parts of it unconstitutional, which could throw labor relations in this country just into chaos, which is, would be just great for corporate America, especially SpaceX, Trader Joe's, and Amazon, where there are people who are you know trying to organize fight for better wages, hours, conditions. Uh, but she says, and, and this, this is a beautiful statement. She says, it seems like a growing number of deep pocket, low road employers are jumping on the bandwagon, seeking preliminary injunctions in the court sl solely to slow down or prevent us from engaging in our enforcement actions against them because they have the money to do so. Unfortunately, she said, it seems to me that they would rather spend their money initiating court litigation rather than making their workers' lives and their own workplace operations better. Uh, so, she said, uh, their primary goal in my mind is to divert our scarce resources away from protecting workers' rights to organize and to fight for the rec for recognition and respect for the value that they add to their employer's operations. And that is not going to happen, she said. We are not going to postpone or cease our investigations or litigation or compliance or election work while we wait, await the court to presumably, resoundingly, reject once again the long-rejected challenges that have been launched against us. And look, the, the reality is, I love somebody who's going to go, look, we're not, we're not waiting around for, for this to be, be done. We're, we're going to do our job. We're going to do what, what, 89 years of decided law uh, on their side has told them that they're going to do. Gives, gives me hope. Gives me hope that the, the people that are in there now marching forward. Uh, also, over at the uh, Federal Trade Commission, 
and the DOJ. Uh, they filed a statement of interest recently in this hotel algorithm fixing case. And this is this is something that, again, what I love that Biden's talking about is all the junk fees and all the ways corporate America is screwing us out of nickels and dimes here and and, and all of this stuff. Um, and I like the fact that the, the DOJ and the Federal Trade Commission are, are looking into this. Uh, what this case is about is you got these hotel chains, uh, especially in areas where there isn't much competition to begin with because they've been bought up by by big actors anyway. But they use these these third party corporations who who have these algorithms who they uh, they figure out when people are going to be around, when things are going to be slow. You may have heard me talk about the idea of dynamic pricing. Um, Wendy's wanted to try and go this route, actually made a public statement that they were going to go that way. And then when the public lost their minds, said, no, 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 we, we, we've changed our minds. Trust me, it's coming back. They're not going to let go of this because it is. It's so lucrative. And you go, okay, well, this is true capitalism, Rick. This is the law of supply and demand. This is all that stuff. You know, when, when you know more people want a good, the price should go up. So, you know, at lunchtime at Wendy's or McDonald's or wherever, um, that, that you know, dollar hamburger should go for $2 because there are more people wanting it. Scarcity. That's not competition. And again, remember, the, the idea of the free market is, well, you know, having the information, um, there being competition and having the ability to, uh, to abstain. Um, what we're seeing is an awful lot of, I'm not going to call it collusion. Uh, collusion's been one of those words that's been, uh, been beat up here recently. Let's call it, um, again, the word I liked all during the Trump years when they were talking about the Russian stuff was coordination. Uh, now, understand the, uh, the the Department of of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission uh, in this uh, this case, uh, Cornish uh, ad buy versus Caesars Entertainment, uh, which they're saying, look, you know, you can't collude on price fixing. You can't use this algorithm. Uh, this is one of those moments where you go finally someone looking out and using the laws we have because they said, look. Uh, plaintiffs don't need to identify direct communications between competitors to allege an agreement under Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, particularly when they use this algorithm that does it for them. So there doesn't need to be that meeting. You know, to prove collusion, you needed in the past to go, OK, there were a bunch of people who got together in a smoke filled room somewhere and said, ah, we're not going to we're not going to rent a room for less than X amount of dollars. And it was hard to prove. This a little different because you have these these apps, you have this 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 algorithm that that sets this stuff that can well raise prices at the drop of a hat. And look, we buy a lot of things online. I I do as well. The power that we give those those entities is pretty 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 remarkable. I love the fact that finally someone's looking at this from a, a consumer's perspective. Is this best for, for the consumer? Is this, again, fostering competition? Because it seems to me, no matter where you go, it, it's all about the same. It seems like the game's already rigged. And it seems to me like it would be great to have a champion on our side. So for me, when I when I saw this stuff today, my mind went into this place of going, you know, this is the reason that you need a a working class president. Uh, this is the reason you want working class folks in uh, Congress. This is the reason you want to be voting for people who really do understand what it's like uh, to work hard uh, and and sadly get screwed like we're like we're getting uh, this. This is remarkable to me, and it's only one little thing. Imagine how much power these apps and these these internet companies have over our daily lives. And have we have we begun to to, to regulate? Have we begun to to rein the, their power in? No. And I keep saying, while we're fighting over nonsense, 
um, we're not fighting for progress. And that progress should be making our lives better, shouldn't it? So I got to tell you, I love the fact that uh, we've got decent people in these positions. But understand, come November, uh, we make the wrong choices. This all goes away and we end up with, well, you know what we end up with. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, is this a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, do you think hotels you know, using a, a, a an algorithm or a third-party company to, well, do their price fixing? think that's a good thing. think it's good when you go to a baseball game that they have dynamic pricing. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break when we come back. Uh, China, some, some interesting stuff on the China front. Going to talk with our good friend Scott Paul. Back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the other day I'm driving in the car and you know, sometimes I do this, I do this too, so you don't have to. Uh, I turned on right wing talk radio and uh, left it on for uh, probably an hour. And the almost the entire time, all I heard was, well, ob- the obvious Joe Biden bashing, but the the EV bashing. Uh, how horrible electric vehicles are going to be, how horrible, uh, you know, the whole, th- the whole thing, it's going to control your life. It's, uh, you know, they made some valid points on some points, but overall, wow, the hair on fire insanity of the, the next technology that cre- could create jobs aplenty, especially for people in their st- in states that, you know, vote for them. Very, very interesting. And here to share some thoughts on why this hair on fire from the right wing Uh, over EVs and over the next generation of manufacturing jobs here in the country. Uh, I've asked our good friend Scott Paul to come talk with us. Scott is the president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, AmericanManufacturing.org, the website. Scott, thanks for taking time for us. Rick, it is always great to be with you. So what do you make of this? I mean, I've been hearing, you know, all over social media, all over talk radio, all of these right wing commentators, all of these Republican politicians just bashing the investment that Biden has made and that we're making in the future of of transportation on the electrical vehicle front. I don't get it, especially considering a large amount of that that investment being done in red states. Yeah. You're right on all of those fronts, and I I don't pretend like I can get inside the heads of those folks to um, articulate exactly what they're feeling or thinking. But you know, I will say, you know, it is perfectly normal to be skeptical about a like a leapfrog technology, right? You know, or or, or moving from the 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 rotary phone to smartphones okay so i i get it 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 is whether you're uncomfortable with technology or you're just used to doing things a certain way Uh, but i also think there's a bit of a political agenda here and that there's some on the right that want to turn like batteries into the new mask right And, and it's just a cultural delineator and that's an enormous mistake because I think that I don't know the time frame here, Rick, but it could be a decade, two decades, three decades. At some point in time, we're all going to be driving EVs. OK, that's just where the technology is headed, just like with the smartphones. OK, that's just that's where we are headed. The, the, the only thing that is in question is 
how fast that's going to occur, number one, and then who's going to be making these vehicles. That's number two. And in the case of smartphones, even though we were pioneers in terms of the technology, almost all of the production occurred in China and it still occurs in Asia. And we still don't make a single mass market smartphone in the United States. And so I want to be in the position when EVs really do catch fire and they will, you know, it's just the early adopters right now, but when they do catch fire, that we're the country that's supplying them and, and that it's not Mexico, it's not, it's not Korea, it's not China, it's in the United States. And, and it's because that means that there's gonna be a whole lot of people who have good jobs uh, in a lot of different states, not only making the EV vehicles, but also in the supply chains that are uh, g going to be supporting that manufacturer. No, and I agree with you. It's it's almost it's inevitable that electric vehicles are the future. What I find interesting is you know all of these complaints. Again, some I I agree with. Look, I don't necessarily want central con control and command of my vehicle. I I don't right. want someone to be able to flip a switch and and drive me wherever they want me to go. And and look, there are some very real. Uh, concerns there. How about we deal with that? Use the outrage, the anger, all the passion that's going into no to, well, you know, dealing with the problems that potentially could come up. Yeah. C connected vehicle data security is a big concern. What most people don't realize is that their internal combustion engine vehicle is already connected if it's a relatively new model. Shh. And the, yeah, <laughs> that there is, that there's the ability uh, you know, for and there have been documented doc, documented successes at this. I know you've seen them too, where people have hacked into to, to vehicle systems, and so that's not limited to EVs. Like that's with us right now, and, and that's a matter of of data security and privacy and protection. Um, no matter what kind of of mobility choice that we're making in, in the United States, but I know one thing for damn sure. It, you know, I don't want them to be Chinese vehicles, because then it's almost guaranteed that uh, your data is getting back in some way on demand uh, to the Chinese government. That would be a huge mistake. But but that's not, you know, that's not reason alone to give them up. And, and, and I, you know, I just want to focus just on performance for a second. You know, you rightly point out that, you know, as a truck driver, any kind of driver, the experience in refueling is different for uh, gas powered versus EV right that EV right now. And that's totally true, okay? Th that is true, but it is changing and it is getting better every day. And uh, it is not too far on the horizon where you'll see at a parking lot of a grocery store or uh, you know a, a, a retail store, um, something that looks like a gas station, but will have those chargers where you'll be able to go into that retail store and your car will be charged by the time you come out. And so it's it's a little bit of a different pattern for folks. Or if you sit down in a restaurant, it's going to be the same kind of thing. Or as you point out, Rick, at a truck stop, the technology will be there to uh, get you from 10% uh, up to 80% uh, in the same amount of time, pretty much as if you went in there uh, and you, you know, you took a bathroom break, you got a bite to eat, you stretched your legs or whatever. You made a couple of calls and you come back out. Yeah, right. No, yeah, I so, happen, the reason so, I brought that up to you during the break is, you know, I've been seeing all these social media posts of people going, you know, in 15 minutes, you can refuel a truck and, you know, be on the road and drive 1200 miles. And I'm going, I don't know. I've never been in and out of, in and out of a truck stop in 15 minutes. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, because it's at least an hour every time I stop in one of these truck stops. Uh, so, you know, there, let's at least talk on the right levels. But I'm hoping you're right. I'm hoping we get to the place where, you know, it's just something different, uh, not yeah. the, the um, you know, the, the, the nightmare that they've presented for us. Right. And, and it will, and this is the thing, it's like, name a technology that was perfect when it was first introduced, right? Whether it's, anything in robotics or anything in electronics, you know, they, they work the, the, the glitches out. And that's where we, we're beyond the beta phase now. Now it's just a matter of building up that capacity. Right. 
Um, and it will come. And I would just say, as someone who, you know, has 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 been in a number of electric vehicles and in internal combustion engine vehicles, um, there is a lot to love about the acceleration and performance of of those EVs. It is it is pretty extraordinary uh, once you experience it. And there is also a great joy in not paying a dime for gasoline. I'm just going to say. So um, it, it feels really good not, not to do that. And so it, it will, people will catch on to that and, and word will spread, but it is a, again, we're at the very early stage of this. It's like the people you saw initially who had the iPhones and you're like, oh, that'll never catch on. No, no, not the iPhones, <laughs> the bag phones. I remember having a bag phone going, oh, this is garbage. I don't know why I pay for this. <laughs> yeah yeah that's that that's right we're 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 kind of in you know we're struggling through the, again this this happens all the time with like the types of work that we do and you know i'm old enough where i took like a typewriting class in high school you may have as well where you learned how to type on an actual typewriter and then within five years no one was using typewriters anymore so it's going to happen. Yep. Uh, but but I want the jobs to be here. If you, if you adopt the Republicans' approach to this, there will be EVs in the United States eventually, and they'll all be made in China. And, and that's going to be a terrible outcome, one that we don't want to see. No, because, you know, I was just reading an article. I think it was at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and they were talking about uh, the, the next shock of, uh, of China's dumping no. uh, and flooding, you know, the, the world with cheap stuff. And, you know, my mind goes to, you know, for decades now, I've been talking about how bad tearing down, you know, capital and, and capital borders are and how bad it's been for tearing down, uh, you know, borders for, for goods and services because you're going to have someone like this who is going to dominate the industry and and, the, and drop the floor out of the bottom. And that's bad for, for, you know, economies that are high wage economies like ours. And for me, we're I think we're in a moment where potentially maybe we start erecting some of those borders again to to you know to protect our industries and our, our way of life and our standard of living. And yes, I am I'm a protectionist. I, I make no bones about it. I'm not an isolationist. I've said this before. When I leave the house, I lock the door. I don't have a giant moat around my house. But I do make sure that 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 what I what we need in our home is protected. And I think as a country, we've got to start thinking that way again. Yeah, there is no shame in defending your jobs and defending your quality of life, right? I mean, that is what what we all are, are built to do. And I think what we expect our policymakers to do as well. And so the challenge that you point out is that first, China has had a head start on all of this. They They viewed EVs very much as a leapfrog technology early and invested a ton of money in it and used our technology you know, basically through joint ventures or forced technology transfers or just outright theft and build up the capacity to do this with tens of billions of dollars in state subsidies. And now they have so much industrial capacity in automobiles in China uh, that it's about five to 10 million units more than they have demand in China. And so that's five to 10 million units that they need to sell somewhere else in the world and just you know the u.s auto market in any year is about a 15 million dollar i'm mean, sorry 15 million unit uh market which is large but it can't absorb the kind of shock that you would see coming from these these chinese imports which by the way are also impossibly priced it's right. like you can get an suv for like fourteen thousand bucks and you're like how is that even possible it's like, well, if you have a, a, a supply chain that's built on slave labor, if you have all these massive subsidies and if you're selling it cheaper here, you know, in, in other markets, that's what you can do. And, and so that's going to be the playbook. And we've seen it. We know how this turns out, Rick. We know we've seen it in steel. We saw it in glass. We saw it in paper. We saw it in semiconductors. We saw it in microelectronics. We know how it turns out is that we will just become consumers rather than producers and it will not make our country better off if we're just consumers of automobiles and not producers of them. You know, it comes back to the question I keep asking, and I've been asking for years. Are you a worker first or a consumer first? 
Uh, and that's going to that's going to you know guide your uh, your choices on who you vote for, on what you purchase, on all of that stuff. Are you are you worried about your job or hey, I can get I can get cheap stuff, get a whole basket full of it. Now, the thing that gets me is um I look at where our politicians are, and they seem to be, especially on the right, bashing these EVs. Um, and I talk to you know working people every day who don't know what's really going on because our media seems to be all over the place. Yeah. Um, I don't think the Biden administration has done a good enough job of going, hey, look, uh, we're investing in, the, in these these facilities. These are real people getting real jobs. This is real infrastructure being built. This is this is a real future. Um, or, or am I just, you know, maybe not seeing the right things? You are totally seeing it. And, and, and here's the thing. I mean, this is very dangerous for Republican lawmakers to do, because if you look at the states where you've seen a lot of the CEV investment, you're looking at places like Michigan and Ohio. You're looking at Tennessee and Kentucky. You're looking at Alabama and Georgia. And, you know, a couple of those states are swing states, right? You know, and so it is like uh, there's great peril in that. And there are workers right now who I guarantee are registered Republicans who have a job building batteries or building EVs who are, you know, if they if they see their lawmakers are like, you know, want to put them out of business, that's that's not a good look for a policymaker to have. So. They, they ought to really think twice about how politicized they're trying to make uh, these EVs. And, tr you know, everybody from Trump on down, um, I, I think it's a huge mistake to do this. And, yeah, it's easy to poke fun at a new technology, just like it was for the people who had iPhones initially. But there are billions of them sold in the world every year right now. And we don't make a single damn one of them right here. And so that cannot happen. With EVs, so we cannot follow where Republicans want to lead us. No, I'm, I'm right there with you, uh, which is why you know if we're if we're moving in this direction, I want us to be uh, have the corner on the market at least at least domestically. I mean, look, China can produce for China, but I've always That's been, right. and I say it again, I've been said it a million times. I'm a big believer in domestic production for domestic consumption should be made here, especially this kind of cross border technology with the ability to. Uh, well, as you pointed out as well, uh, to to be able to control those vehicles from afar, uh, I, I don't yeah. I don't think I want the Chinese Communist government par in charge of that. I just don't. Uh, but Scott, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time. I look forward to talking to you again real soon. You bet. Uh, happy to be with you, Rick. Appreciate it. Our good friend Scott Paul. What do you think? Uh, are EVs the future? You looking forward to getting one, or are you in the camp of no? I want my gas guzzler. I want to know. Let me know. Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Right back. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. Well, as the 2024 presidential election rapidly approaches, uh, the importance of talks radio cannot be overstated. Talk Radio serves as a vital platform for political discourse, providing a space for diverse voices, yours, mine, ours, and opinions to be heard by millions of folks across the country. In this crucial election year, Talk Radio has the potential to shape public opinion, influence voter behavior, and, and even, I hope not... <laughs> Uh, in a way, impact this election. That's why I've asked Michael Harrison to come talk with us. He's the founder and publisher of Talkers Magazine, the talk radio Bible, the go-to publication for everything talk radio. Michael, thanks for taking time for us. Rick, it's great to be with you. Thank you, and thank you for the fine work that you do within this medium. So let me let me let, let's jump right into this. Uh, I, I hear all the time talk radio is not relevant. Is talk rel radio relevant in this age of podcasts and the internet? Well, I have personally, I have personally been active in talk radio um, since uh, 1975, and we started Talkers in 1990, and there hasn't been a day that's gone by all the way back to the beginning where I don't answer the question, is talk radio about to die? Is talk radio relevant? Does anybody listen? And lately, there's a lot of, is radio about to die? But they've been saying that for 
long time, even before I was even in the business. I've been in the radio business since the late 60s. And people were asking those questions. So uh, what was it? Uh, Mark Twain said the uh, news of my death has been greatly exaggerated. As long as people are asking whether something is still relevant and whether it's dying, that means it's relevant. Otherwise, no one would ask. It would just be gone. So, yes, talk radio is very relevant and radio is very relevant. And I won't say they're here to stay, but they're going to be here for uh, quite a while going forward. They may not be the long-term future, but they are the here and now. But, you know, I keep hearing people go, everyone's got a podcast, Michael. Uh, so, you know, you, it's not the 1950s or the 1940s where radio was king, but how much radio, how much reach do you think talk radio has compared to other forms of media in this moment? The podcast, the internet, uh, the YouTubes, all that stuff. The only forms of media that are really, really growing and dominant are the big tech media, uh, YouTube, Facebook, X, um, Instagram. The big tech media have taken the lunch out of the um, traditional media's, uh, you know, off the table. Um, and, and mostly in advertising and in terms of buzz. So um, I would say that all media here in the 21st century, and, and we're getting deeper into the 21st century, we've got a quarter of it already under our belts, all media is fighting more competition for increasingly smaller pieces of the media pie. This is not a radio thing. Look at movies, look at television, look at newspapers, magazines, look at the record industry. Um, they've been so disrupted by um, the, the fractionalization imposed by digital media. So to single radio out is not, it's not an accurate or a fair um, depiction. Um, with that being said, radio remains relative to itself and to the here and now, as you point out, extremely important. Um, I'm not going to get into the most important medium and all of that because times are changing so quickly. The question is rhetorical at this point. Yeah, and the reality is, is, you know, anyone can have a podcast. It's a matter of, is anyone, is anyone listening to it? And, you know, we're on about 50 stations across the country and we get feedback from people all across the country. Um, our podcast, you know, doesn't have the same numbers that our radio audience does because honestly, we don't spend a lot of time promoting that podcast. But you know, that is part of the future, isn't it? I mean, you, you've got it in this day and age. Whether you're terrestrial, whether you're on TV as we are, you've got to be in the podcast space. You got to be in the internet space. You've got to be all over the place. You can't just, at least I don't think, be in one one arena. Well, it depends on how you are branding yourself. I mean, the word brand is a very important word, and we can get into a discussion of that for hours. But um, branding is very important. However, the key is to have all of your different platforms work in harmony as opposed to cannibalize themselves. I mean, so much of the popularity of the aforementioned big tech media platforms was fueled by attention, um, absolute fawning attention given to them by radio and newspapers and, and, and traditional media. It's like, don't you see that it's a competition? Don't you see if you have a radio show when you say go listen to a podcast uh, that, in fact, you're telling people to tune out the radio show? Um, everybody's in competition with everything, including ourselves. We're in comp our brand is in competition with the different platforms. So it's important for a media practitioner to get them in harmony and get them balanced so that the brand is, is, um, is promoted, but not at the expense of the place where the numbers are important. I know this gets a, it's a little complicated, but these are complicated times. Yeah. Um, anybody can have a podcast. Look, anybody can have a typewriter or now a keyboard. That doesn't make you the next great American novelist. Um, anybody can go out and play baseball uh, at the local park. It doesn't make it Yankee Stadium. Anybody can put on a play um, in their backyard or in the community theater or in their high school, but it doesn't make it Broadway. They, we can't lose sight of what the big time means. And for radio, for professional radio to survive and succeed, it's got to provide the best audio entertainment out there, or it will just fade into the background like so many podcasts that nobody listened to.
That's, uh, it's an excellent point. And, and I want to go back to the you know, 2024. The election is, is, you know, only a couple of months away. Uh, you know, I look at the, the talk radio landscape and it is overwhelmingly conservative voices. And I've got friends who believe that because of that, 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 that prowess, that power that the right has over the talk radio sphere, that potentially you could see this election moving in that direction. Does talk radio have that kind of power? Well, talk radio, all media has power. Talk radio has tremendous power when it comes to politics. And most commercial talk radio, commercial talk radio is indeed self-described as conservative. However, all radio is not commercial talk radio. Uh, we don't talk about public radio as being radio. We, somehow we think it's apples and oranges. It's not. Public radio is radio, too. It's the same dial, AM, FM, podcasts, online, the whole thing. It's the same basic uh, set of platforms. It's radio. And, you know, um, uh, public radio, and I'm not talking about just NPR, because public radio is bigger than just NPR. Public radio will deny that it's left of center. Oh, no, we're, you know, we're not biased. It's, it, they have their own version of fair and balanced. But the fact of the matter is, Basically, when you look at radio, the big picture of radio, all news radio, sports talk radio, news talk radio and the commercial and the public radio uh, stations, because it's the same dial. Um, I'd say that all points of view are presented. The problem with today's media, and, and it's part of your question, is that instead of putting it out there and seeing what comes back, today's media practitioners target audiences based on what they see as a vacuum and an opportunity to get an audience and to uh, be able to get clicks and eyeballs and eardrums and, and sales and, and subscriptions and likes and all of that stuff. And they cater to what people already believe. In other words, there's a lot of preaching to pre-selected choirs and tell, and, and, and the, I call it the daily dance of affirmation, telling people what they want to hear, as opposed to telling people what you know, what you think, and let the chips fall the way they, they may. This has been a major change in the recent, uh, I'd say, 10 years, 15 years, and I find it to be disturbing, and I find it to be dangerous. Do you think it's the, the end of the, the medium, or do you think it will only make it bigger as people seek their silos? Uh, I fear that by having you know silos in this form where we never talk to each other, we stop talking to each other. And as a result, we don't have a national popular culture. As a result, it actually disintegrates the foundation of nationhood. And this is a problem facing the United States today is that uh, we see it as polarization. We see it as um, uh, insurmountable obstacles to communicating with each other. But it's actually these bubble universes, these echo chambers, as we call them, that are tearing people apart. And when we don't have a common national culture, you know, there's no Ed Sullivan show on Sunday night. Uh, we recently had the Oscars. Most people haven't even seen any of the movies and can't even name what movie won? Oh, Oppenheimer, because it became part of the pop culture with uh, Barbie. That was in the news. Two movies the whole year. <laughs> I mean, come on. Think of the world you grew up in. Um, so uh, what what song is number one on Billboard? Does anybody know? What's the best-selling uh, book in the country? Does anybody know? Uh, the popular culture that defines a nation has disintegrated, and therein lies a lot of the problems we're having in terms of cohesiveness and communicating. Now, if you ask, you know, either side, the red hat or the blue hat, it's the other side's fault. Uh, whose fault is it? Well, it, it, it's all of our fault. Every uh, since when has any politician or political party represented pure virtue? I mean, you know, if anything, one of the things we're learning in this era of scams and deceit is that most of our institutions have to we have to protect ourselves from the institutions we used to rely on um, as being uh, true and supportive and honest. You know, big tech, big pharma, uh, big religion, big government. I mean, the Democrats and the Republicans, neither side can be counted on for, for truth, honesty, and for heroes. Where are the statesmen or statespeople? Uh, where are they? Um, th there has been a deterioration in principles, 
in in the idea of glory, uh, in the idea of a higher principle and something to to strive for. These are the problems we face. To fix this is going to take a long time because education becomes involved, parenting uh, gets involved, the principles of a culture. What kind of a culture, what kind of a people are we? When the political parties, Democrats or Republicans, preach fear and and uh, demon, demonization of the other side. Every little thing demonized. Every little possible flaw that you can find in the opponent cherry picked and presented. Uh, the problems are far greater than who's to blame. No, but you could make the argument that you know. You know, talk radio magnifies those differences. You've got politicians who are now more concerned about clicks and views and getting their uh, their name on the podcast circuit than actually passing legislation that are going to make people's lives better. Yeah. Well, I mean, but if you look back in history, um, the, the modern technology of social media and the rapid pace at which we communicate with each other and the access we have to everything in the world that ever existed um, only amplifies something that has always gone on. There's always been yellow journalism. There's always been corruption in politics. If you look up how many elected officials have been arrested or imprisoned, the list is, I, I thought I was going to find like 20 or 40, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds over history, all the way back to the beginning. Yeah. Corruption in the public space has, has always been prevalent. Um, I don't know if things are getting worse. I think they're just getting louder. It's a noisy world, and we're and 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 we're becoming ill from it. While other people thrive on it, a lot of people see this as a blood sport, as a as a spectator sport. They don't know a damn thing about issues or politics, but they love the battle. They've forgotten the difference between getting excited about the fantasy of a football game and the fantasy in their mind that they have their egos invested in, but not their brains uh, of a political election. No, and, and again, I keep coming back. My true north has always been, how do we make the lives of working people better? How do we make uh, that kid growing up in the housing project uh, that I grew up in, uh, how do we get that kid the opportunities, at least the opportunities that I've had, if not better? And sadly, I don't see that coming out of our politics. So, you know, with the, the election coming around, um, what are you seeing as the main messages coming out of talk radio on all sides? Is Is there a central theme that you see uh, when, because again, we're we're in our silos of red hat, blue hat. Uh, what are you seeing? The, what I see is a is a common theme that you can't trust anybody, that you can't trust uh, the judiciary, that you can't trust the legislature, that you cannot trust the executive branch, that you can't trust your local dog catcher, that you can't trust the DA, that you can't trust the hospitals. I find that there is a an increase in distrust. And I believe that that if, if I had to find a common theme of talk radio or any of the talk media that talk radio has spawned or any opinion, editorial oriented media, I find that to be the, the, the predominant message is that you can't trust anybody. No, I'm right there with you. Michael, I appreciate uh, the time. I want to pick up some more of this on the on the other side in our uh, our podcast forum. Uh, but Michael Harrison, Talkers Magazine, appreciate the time. Thank you, Rick. Uh, for our free speech TV audience, for our radio affiliates across the country, if you want to check out more of my conversation here with Michael Harrison, uh, go to our website, thericksmithshow.com, uh, where you will find the full interview with Michael Harrison of Talk Talkers Magazine. Going to take a quick break. Right back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 2006. That was the day of massive protests for immigrants' rights in cities throughout the United States. Starting in March of 2006, there was a series of coordinated protests in response to a bill passed by the United States House of Representatives. The bill would classify undocumented workers as felons, and it proposed a wall be built along one third of the U.S.-Mexican border. In total, more than 
and 5 million people across the country protested that spring. And on this day, protests were held in more than 100 cities. On May 1st, or May Day, large protests reached numbers not seen since the civil rights demonstrations of the 1960s. CNN described the impact of the protests in Chicago, reporting kids skipped school, men and women walked off their jobs, others didn't bother to go to work, businesses shut down for lack of patrons or employees. The protesters dubbed the May Day event a day without immigrants. The aim was to withhold immigrant labor and buying power to show their impact on the U.S. economy. A study by the Pew Hispanic Center found that at the time, undocumented workers made up 24% of farm labor and 14% of construction labor in the United States. The protests had had an impact. The bill that would harshen penalties for undocumented workers did not pass the Senate. The AFL-CIO also recognized the importance of reaching out to immigrant workers. In August of 2006, the AFL-CIO introduced a National Worker Center Partnership. For the first time, worker centers, many of which organize immigrant workers, could enter into formal partnerships with the AFL-CIO. Working with immigrant workers remains an important front in today's labor movement. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. A new study commissioned by the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Uh, International IDEA is the name of the group. Uh, What they found, uh, and I guess not surprising, Uh, Voters around the world have shown widespread skepticism around the idea that elections are free and fair, uh, and many, many favor a strong and undemocratic leader. And and it's it's kind of shocking to me that we're in this moment, because I understand we've been pursuing this idea of democracy, of of rule of the governed uh, my entire lifetime. This has been the great American experience. Uh, the uh, the survey, the Perceptions of Democracy survey, polled voters in 19 countries, including three of the world's largest democracies, Brazil, India, and here at home in the U.S. And oh, well, <laughs> uh, not great. Uh, in the U.S., experts evaluated the uh, uh, the terms. Understand, we're supposed to have the, the most highly performing democracy, while only 40%... 47% of the people who responded uh, said that they had faith in the in a credible electoral process. You got to give the right wing credit. They have really done a masterful, and, and look, the left as well, they've done a masterful job of tearing at elections. Uh, 17 of the 19 countries polled, fewer than half, according to this study, fewer than half of the people are satisfied with their government, and only four countries um, have a majority of people who feel uh, that they're doing better than their parents. Uh, 11 of the 19 countries, fewer than half of the people say that the last election was free and fair. In 18 of 19 countries, fewer than half of the people believe the courts always or often provide access to justice. In India and in Tanzania, uh, a majority of the population are satisfied with the government's pop. They're, they're, their performance. Um, India and Tanzania also stand out as countries with relatively high levels of support for a strong leader uh, who doesn't they don't have to bother with that whole you know, parliament or elections or any of that. Uh, Colombia, Romania, Brazil, and Sierra Leone, uh, the, the poorest in, the, in society, uh, they say that they approve of government performance uh, over the rest. I found it interesting that in Iraq, uh, Iraqis have more faith in access to justice in their court system, 28% always or often, than we do here at home, 26%. You stop and you think about that one thing. Things have become so polarized, so politicized, so demonized that the court system, which used to be the place where we sought some bit of fairness, where the person at the front of the court was supposed to be the arbiter of justice, not of ideology, 
And what we've done with this system, again, we've, we've destroyed what was a great system by political polarization. I know, I know. But, Rick, you know, the court systems of, you know, it's always done. Uh, not to this level. I mean, I look at what's going on in, in the red hat, blue hat world, and the first thing, and I do it too. I'm now of the mindset, who appointed them? There used to be this, this deference to law. This love of the, the law, this this idea that the law was above red hat, blue hat, Democrat, Republican. It was above that. It was the foundation of this country. And when you undermine the rule of law, when you destroy that institution that the people believe is going to, you know, at least be somewhat fair. You know, Lady Liberty and Justice with the blindfold, and you know, we're gonna we're gonna balance it out. It's one of the ways authoritarian leaders weaken democracy. If you weaken the, the rule of law, if you get the, uh, the electorate to believe that there's no such thing as fairness, that there, there are no, no rules that apply, that the rich and the powerful can manipulate the legal system, that you, know, you can use law enforcement to target your political opponents. The fact that, and this is what blows my mind, the fact that law enforcement has become such a political football I said from the very beginning, we had someone on the show who said, well, we're going to defund the police. And I'm like, no, that's dumb. Don't do that. We're not defunding the police. Um, you should fund the police to where they have more resources to be able to deal with certain issues it, differently. I'm all in favor of that. But don't say dumb things like defund the police. It's bad messaging and it's bad policy. How about... How about we stop allowing the police to deal with all of societal's problems? How about we stop um, creating an environment where they're the trash collectors and have to deal with all of society's ills? Because we've cut funding to mental health. We've stopped trying to defeat poverty. Uh, we've stopped trying to end homelessness. We've tr stopped trying to do all of these things while then heaping all these mandates on the police. As I said from the beginning, I support the police when they're not wrong. When they're doing their job, when they're doing what we ask them to do, when we're doing what we have tasked them to do, I am 100% in support. Now, do you get some people who go outside of that? Yeah, and those folks I don't support. See, we used to be able to think like this, but evidently it's become hot potato. Uh, it's red hat, blue hat. I got to be on one side, the other's got to be on the other side, and we shall fight each other without any... Hey, um, we, we actually do need... We actually do need police. You need some bit of law enforcement. You need some bit of stability. And this is what the authoritarian crowd wants. They love the fact that the law is, is now, well, it's a patronage game. And this idea that elections are, are all jerry-rigged and, you know, you can, you can do all kinds of voter suppression and voter fraud and intimidate people and do all the things that authoritarians of the past have always done. It's one of the ways you destroy democracy. You manipulate elections. It's the reason Saddam Hussein got 98% of the vote. It's the reason Vladimir Putin gets, you know, an outrageous number of the vote. Not because people want him but because it's a rigged game and everyone knows it. We still have the opportunity to go and cast our ballots in free and fair elections. No one has brought forth evidence to say here in this country, the election was rigged. Now, a lot of people believe it. Oh, they believe to their core. They're the same ones who believed when the uh, solar eclipse was happening that they were going to be raptured up into the sky. And, and I hope they were. Because we could do without them. But we're in this moment where this election really is about do you believe in democracy or do you not? You know, we could talk about all the other things, and, and I do, uh, the economic side of things, uh, the, the justice side of things, uh, the, 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 the good policy on reshoring manufacturing and investing in infrastructure and helping our kids and helping the homeless, all that stuff. But if democracy dies, all that goes with it. None of it matters if this wonderful experiment of self-rule ends because we've allowed the Trumpkins and the, the MAGA hats and the rest of them to weaken our independent uh, institutions. 
uh, to destroy the judiciary, to destroy our legislative bodies, to destroy the electoral process. If we allow them to do that and replace them, pack them with loyalists, you know, making patronage great again, this liberty and this freedom that we have as Americans will go away. Because, look, we've already got the cult of personality. Uh, Donald Trump is that that cult of personality that history will remember him for. Uh, the propaganda, the rhetoric that we see all around him, this idea that they put his head on Rambo's body and he's the, the, the greatest enemy of... It's, it's insane. And the more I look at this, the more I say, you know what, we, we do need a sense of, of sanity. And you look at the fact that there is corruption and cronyism and all of the things that are going on around us. And I find it, I find it really ironic. Uh, honestly and truthfully, I find it really ironic that the right keeps looking at, pointing at Joe Biden going, he's corrupt when mm, uh, the guy that, the Trumpkin guy, that's the corrupt guy. But I guess we can't have those conversations. Because we've got to quash that that ability to interact and to talk to each other and to, to challenge each other. The hope is we get back out in the streets and we, we engage in that in that discussion and that fight for democracy. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, could this be the last free and fair election that we we have in our lifetime, as some have told me? And are you willing to fight for what we have or watch it go away? I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast. And as always, I appreciate you being here. See you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email rick at rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.